I'm Clarence McIntosh. Sitting with me in the library of Bidwell Mansion is William H. Hutchinson. He's a professor emeritus of history at California State University, Chico. We're here to talk about the place of John Bidwell in the Westward Movement. You want if you, me to talk about if you were, to, if you were uh, looking at, at John Bidwell's uh, role or his place in the Westward Movement, uh, yeah. how would you, uh, what, how would you de describe or define it? Well, Mac, I thought about Bidwell quite a bit because I have to I'm teaching the Westward Movement. It's the first, really, first party of avowed agricultural immigrants or settler immigrants to come to California. It seems to me, sir, that Bidwell in his life, both typifies the Westward Movement and is atypical of it. And if you have enough time here, we might get around to describing it. But look, the man's born in 1819. He died 81 years later from overexertion, from chopping down an oak tree. Now, he didn't have to chop down an oak tree when he was 81 years old, for heaven's sake. But the kind of breed that he represented, the people he represented, that to me, it's, it's, he typifies the whole thing. And his birth date is rather significant here, 1819. Of course, there is the, the financial panic after the War of 1812. But in that year, it was the adams onye Treaty, the so-called Transcontinental Treaty, which settled a lot of the boundary disputes between the United States and Spain. We got Florida, for example. We acquired Spain's claim <laughs> to the Oregon country, everything north of 42 degrees, which is the present northern boundary of the state and west of the Continental Divide. Spain also uh, turned that over to England, and we had another agreement with England. But the thing to me that is significant in Bedwell uh, is the fact that the Treaty of 1819 established the boundary between Spanish Texas and the Louisiana Purchase, which we made in 1803. Now, they drew the lines in the map. Where in the world they were on the face of the land itself, nobody really knew. But here, when that treaty was signed, as nearly as I've been able to ascertain, and you can correct me if you want to, and you probably will, <laughs> but the mood of the nation in 1819 Monroe, President Monroe, uh, the Jacksonians haven't emerged out of uh, politics yet. The mood of the nation is that geographical predestination had fixed the western boundary of the United States at the Continental Divide, the Rocky Mountains. So what? 22 years later, 1841, young John Bidwell heads for California. Well, he didn't know how to go to California. You go to Soda Springs and turn to the left, I suppose, something like this. But you see, in that 22-year period, uh, what I have come to call the, the mud sills of manifest destiny, which is a shibboleth, a term that we don't use until this Democratic newspaper editor in New York, uh, O'Sullivan, puts it together in 1845. But you have the fur trade begins out of St. Louis, 1821-22. You have Mexico's independence from Spain, which opens up the Santa Fe trade. You have Austin, who had Moses Austin and his son, Steve, then his son, Stephen F. Been Missourians, had gone broke after the Panic of 1819. They go in to Texas to recoup their fortunes. So you open up the Texas question. And then there's Oregon shimmering out there in the far northwestern corner. So it's these things that come together. It's, uh, I suppose the analogy is all right for instructional use, but it's like making home brew, which you're a little too young to remember that, but not me. You just keep putting in the yeast cakes, and I think this is what those four things were, just dropping another yeast cake into this ferment, so that by 1840-41, the Jacksonians are committed to creating a nation so strong that not even fools could destroy it. And that means expansion to the Pacific. And they elect James K. Polk basically on that basis, the last of the great Jacksonians. Now, Bidwell is in there. 
If he'd stayed in Ohio, Lord knows. But he's in Missouri. He goes to Missouri. And there, that is the really the epicenter of this ferment, as far as I've been able to put it together. So in that way, I think he, he typifies this restless, seeking desire to go west. And we come in time to call it manifest destiny. Well, of course, he didn't think of that in one sense. Uh, as I've uh, read what he has written about himself, he, he comes to the West because he viewed himself a failure after his claim had been jumped there in Missouri, and he yeah. didn't want to go back to Ohio before he became a success. The interesting thing is you can find that in the, the reminiscences of other people. They wanted to come West to prove themselves and to become successes. Uh, another thing I found in his, his uh, diary is the fact that he wanted to just see the country. There's a sense of adventure about this. And uh, others say this also. Uh, Josiah Belden, who was a member of the same party, uh, had a sense of adventure in, in coming. We have uh, one man who would come in the party and getting away from his wife. But uh, Talbot Green. Yes. Yeah. But but uh, but uh, John Bidwell would not be married, of course, at that time. No. He would be, well, uh, Nancy Kelsey, would, in her reminiscence, would call him one of the boys, yeah. and by that which means she'd be one of the young single men in oh, the yeah. party. Yeah. And because uh, in those days, the minute you got married, you were old man, whatever. Mm -hmm. No matter what age you got married, mm -hmm. the old man. If you were single, you wanted the boy. Then, uh, in 1867, John Bidwell said uh, in one of his letters to his friend, Annie Kennedy, and at that point when uh, a man and, or a woman wrote, Dear Friend, uh, this was a term of, of deep affection. Mm -hmm. uh, here was someone John Bidwell could pour his heart out to, and he, he confessed that when he came to California in 1841, he had had the idea of participating in the overthrow of the Mexican government here. He he's said, how foolish I was at that time, uh, because I, I learned to like the Mexicans, and, and uh, I've always gotten along well with them uh, here in California. But uh, in effect, here I was a young, foolish, young, uh, young, foolish man at this point. And, and, uh, yes, but Mac, look, when a man's writing to a woman, particularly one that he hopes to marry, uh, I don't think he's responsible. <laughs> but uh, I, uh, you see, again, I'm, I, we keep, uh, I keep running into this with students and with historians and with people who say, yes, but the man didn't have a set purpose. He didn't have an ideology. At which point, I, you know, I got a severe case of the malignant Protestant pit about the whole thing. No, he didn't have an ideology or a philosophy. He is one of those yeast fragments because the, the whole thrust westward until the gold rush, the early overlanders are people who are contributing, coming out of the fur trade, the Santa Fe trade, the, the idea that there's something out there. The missionaries going into Oregon. Why go to Oregon? Well, why didn't they work with the Indians in Kansas and whatnot? Well, they did, but Oregon is fascinating. Besides, the dirty British were out there. But these are individuals, and I think it is through their, the cumulative effect of these individual actions that the Jacksonians realize, 1844, that they can win a presidency on the basis of expansion. Now you've got to feed in the Texas question. You've won John Bidwell writes to Annie Ellicott Kennedy that uh, he had come out here with the idea of overthrowing the Mexican government. Good Lord. He had the example in Texas, you see. But I think that's a young man. Uh, and would, would, I don't know whether you were responsible at 22 for what you did. I know damned well I wasn't. But now, well, you said he was, he was atypical in, in yeah, a certain sense. So I think he What do you was. mean by that? Well, you remember Simeon Suggs and the Talapus of Volunteers? <laughs> yeah. Simeon Sugg's motto in the Tallapoosie Volunteers was it pays to be shifty in a new country. I don't think Bidwell was. Um, 
There is a man who, in many respects, there is Old Testament. But he had, uh, I think both Ted Merriam and John Noble mentioned it, the man had a tremendous sense of, of responsibility or duty, call it that, if you will. But I can't find anything. I haven't gone into his life nearly as, as uh, intensively as you have. But in the work I did on Tom Bard down in Ventura County, I find the same thing there that I found with uh, that I think Bidmo had. Men who were honest, straightforward, who would not take unfair advantage, and uh, whose word was better than, uh, you know, most gilt-edged certificates. He wasn't shifty. He wasn't uh, looking for the main chance, no matter what else happened. Uh, call him a solid citizen, an Old Testament 19th century Christian. And I think that's why he is he's atypical, because that early movement out from the Missouri out here in the 1840s, uh, I could go into some of the missionaries up in Oregon, but I won't. I might get on, you know, become unpopular. Um, in a lot of ways, Mac, they're like the, the froth on the wave. And I'm not saying that I would have been any different. I'm out here trying to survive far away. There's no search and rescue squad. There's no social security. There's no aid to dependent children. There are no food stamps. You're on your own. Well, to survive, uh, people will do a hell of a lot of things that they wouldn't do if they were in a normal situation. But I don't I can never find where Bidwell or Tom Bard either uh, were that kind of people. So I say in that way, from the early part of the Western movement, that is the uh, critical period there in the 40s. I think he is atypical for that reason. Well, I could be wrong. It's highly unlikely, but I have been wrong before. <laughs> Talk a little bit about this, this Western migration, how, yeah. did, how people did it. Now, to get from the jumping off place on the Missouri River out to, to California would really, it's about 2,000 miles, although yeah. these people hadn't measured in those terms. Um, no, 1,800, 2,000, depending on how you came. Now, uh, people at that time are argued about whether or not it was better to take mules or oxen. And on this Bartleson party, uh, we have mainly oxen. Now, uh, sure. uh, what, what would be the advantages of oxen? There are a number of advantages for oxen. Uh, for one thing, they were handy. That was the, the prime mover, the draft animal in those Missouri settlements and most agricultural settlements. The mules, we begin to get, the mule comes into our life, into our national movement, Western movement, comes into our national life as a result, basically, of the Santa Fe trade. I mean, George Washington, somebody sent him a couple of mules, but uh, and there are a few there in Tidewater, in the Tidewater colonies, southern colonies. But the so-called Missouri mule and whatnot that becomes a mainstay of transport, westward transport, uh, during the gold rush and after, no, they cost too much money, Mac, for people coming out. There. Oxen would be cheaper. Oxen were there. They were available. You see, these people had capital, not in money, but in the tools and implements necessary to an agricultural society. Mm -hmm. Bidwell right. once estimated that the party had under $100 cash well, I think probably when right. it started out. But see, they had the wagons, the plows, the axes, the mill. They didn't have any mill irons, but they had the rifles, the augers, the tools that were necessary for a frontier agricultural mm -hmm. family, a homesteading family. Now, as far as we can tell, uh, the no, members... Wait, don't get away from the oxen yet, because you just tapped a great wellspring of knowledge here. Oxen has a cloven hoof, as you know. Now, in quicksand, that hoof will splay out. He gets better traction. A mule is a very narrow hoof. And in soft ground, and particularly in quicksand, you'll go in quick. Finally, my friend, if worst came to worst, you could eat the oxen. And for some unknown reason, uh, the Anglo-Saxon or the Anglo-Celt, whichever, has an antipathy towards eating the flesh of the various equine specimens. I've eaten it. It's good meat. Well, some of the Bartleson party had to eat mule meat and I found know. it delicious when they were starving. Sure, but they were driven right down to the nub. They ate their oxen first. They ate the oxen first. Well, now these people would have uh, basically like farm wagons. It's a yeah. typical farm wagon that they'd uh, start out with. Um, 
About how, uh, how many miles would they be able to average uh, per day? Well, with a light wagon like that, Mac, and with, I suspect, uh, probably one span or two span, two or four oxen, I suspect they'd use two in a light wagon, but it depends how heavy they had or loaded. Two span, two yoke, four oxen. <sighs> they have to noon, Mac. See, they're not carrying grain. You've got to wait there in the Missouri settlements until the grass is up. Well enough, and the green grass when it comes up, it looks good. Livestock will eat it, and then they get scours, and that which is the equivalent of diarrhea, or dysentery. And the grass is not strong. That's the term. They use. The grass isn't strong enough to keep the stock. But you can't get away from there in the middle of March, first of April. And you've got to noon because you're grass feeding your animals all the time. You've got to lay over at noon for a couple of hours. If they're lucky, Mac, they'll average 9 to 12 miles a day with an ox wagon. And they stopped on Sunday all day. If you didn't, you got down to the Humboldt River, which is the worst from there to Donner Summit or wherever they, you want to go over. You can't wear down your stock. If you do, then you come to the last. You see, we don't realize that from South Pass West, the trail was worse. It just got worse the further west you went from South Pass. The easiest part of the trail, if there's any easy part to it, is from the Missouri jump off points, the port towns, to South Pass. From there on, man, it is bad. Well, it took the party from about May 10th when they decided to move out from Westport to, to Sapling Grove, and there they waited uh, a day or two, but starting, say, to take the date, date of May 10, yeah. it took the party until November 4th to get out to, to John yeah. Marsh's ranch yeah, uh, here in California. Sure. Yeah. And the easy part was up to, to uh, Fort Laramie, and uh, went on to South Pass. they were fortunate in that they had uh, uh, Thomas Fitzpatrick uh, they had joined a party that Fitzpatrick was leading, he was an old fur trapper, uh, to lead them all the way to Soda Springs. Well, that trail is pretty well marked out there, Mac. Uh, at that point, I mean, hell, Bonneville had taken wagons out there in 1832, at least not over South Pass, but he'd taken them out uh, just east of South Pass and north up in the Wind River country. But then they had taken wagons across the divide later on, but the, the American, the first the Rocky Mountain Fur Company, was well, Smith, Jackson, and Sublet, Ashley first, then Smith, Jackson, and Sublet, Rocky Mountain Fur Company, then the American Fur Company. Wyatt and the other freelancers, they'd all come out there, so the trail's fairly well marked, at least as far as Soda Springs and Fort Hall. Now, from Fort Hall west to California, I think the only person who'd been out that way was old Joe Walker partisan for Bonneville in 1833-34. Nobody knew how to get to California overland from Fort Hall. Smith, Jedediah Smith, despite all the things that are said about him on UOP, uh, Smith's route west, down by the Bergen, the Severe and the Bergen River and across the Mojave, and, up, and then his route backwards from probably Sonora Pass to uh, Bear Lake in Utah. I didn't travel that. Nobody didn't travel that. Um, so they, uh, they turned out from Fort Hall, or Soda Springs, wandered around, I guess, until they hit the Humboldt, the head of the Humboldt at about Wells, Nevada today. Well, they had, uh, they hit south there and uh, came, came in on the, the south, south fork of the Yeah, the they came up through the Ruby Mountains to try to skirt the Rubies. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And of course, they had to abandon their wagons at this point because yeah. it was getting late. I think about September yeah, 15th when they, they abandoned the wagons. Wearing down. And they, they had to get to, to uh, California in a hurry. And they... Uh, Wherever that was. Mm -hmm. Well, Bidwell wrote uh, that when they started out, in one sense, all they knew was that California was in the West. That's right. And so, uh, as George Stewart, uh, the historian, has pointed out, that a certain amount of ignorance along with optimism was a necessary thing to... to uh, well, in to that way, trip. again, Mac, they typified the Western Movement because if uh, people in the Western Movement had known what they were up against, I doubt that they would have risked so much. I'm not, not altogether sure today, you see, that the more we know about uh, 
the galaxy we live in and the other galaxies, I think the more unhappy we become, and that's where if we were a little more ignorant and there were a few more mysteries in our life, we'd be a damn sight happier, but that's beside the point. Well, the, uh, it's one of the interesting things about this Bartleson party is the um, fact that some of the members really would play uh, an important role in the development of California. We have uh -huh. John Bidwell here at Chico. Yeah. We have uh, Josiah Belden, who becomes the mayor in, in San Jose. He becomes a, we would call him a real estate developer now. He, I think, probably became the most prosperous member. A little town up here in the Feather River. It's a wide spot in the highways named for him, Belden. We have the uh, Charles Weber, Weber Stockton. who becomes the founder of Stockton, or a founder of Stockton. Uh, we have Robert Tomes, who's, who establishes a big ranch up, up here in the west in side, Hema yeah. County. Mm -hmm. uh, we have uh, Joseph Childs, who comes here in 1841, goes back east in 1842, back and again. then he comes back again in 1843 and opens up a new trail, or yeah, partially a new trail, right. from uh, off the Oregon Trail out of Idaho down into to California, yeah. and. Uh, he plays a, a role here. In Childs, his... Childs must have had a, an itching foot because what, he made something like five round trips back and forth between California and Missouri. Mm -hmm. Well, he's, I, I think this is important in that yeah. because you can see through Childs and well, through these other mem members of this, of this party uh, that they basically took this trip a day at a time and, and they didn't yeah. think about much about walking 2,000 miles. It, it was no, by gosh, something they, they could do. Yeah. Uh, uh, it's amazing, Mike, if you look at those, what some of those people did, mm -hmm. the country they covered on horseback and on foot, it's, it is fantastic. Mm -hmm. But as you say, I think what they did uh, was take it one day at a time, and if you made it through that day, then uh, you'd take the next day as she came. Mm -hmm. Are there 34 people in this party, uh, 32 men? Mm -hmm. And Nancy Kelsey, uh, who was uh, at that point a, a young married woman of the age of 18. She had been married at the age of 15. She has her first child, Anne, that she carries to California. Uh, about a year old, wasn't she? Uh, with her, yeah. about, about a year old. And she had to carry her a great deal of the way. Mm -hmm. um, now, the, the Kelseys, of course, are important in the, in the party. They're, the Kelseys are Kentuckians, and they were good hunters. Uh, and uh, Probably good, the most good efficient track. human predators this continent has ever seen. Yeah. Good, good uh, trail finders, and, mm -hmm. and so Benjamin Kelsey, uh, Bidwell gives credit to as, as being the most important person in getting them to California after they they uh, left Soda Springs. Left Soda Springs, yeah. And uh, now, of course, uh, Kelseyville is named after the Kelseys, uh, but uh, Andrew, his brother. Uh, of course, would be killed by Indians there at, uh, in Clear the area Lake. near Clear Lake because yeah. of the, the troubles he'd later have. Yeah. Then we have this uh, Charles Hopper, who was a hunter, and Hopper would, uh, he was also a Kentuckian, and he would find all sorts of game uh, for them to help, yeah. uh, help get them uh, here into California. But the interesting thing is that, that within a year after these people had come, in 1841, then 12 out of the 34 had left California within a year. And within uh, another year, you had another six or eight leave, so that about half the party was no longer in California uh, within uh, two years after they, they arrived. And thus, for most of the people, or many of the people, it is basically just seeing the country, uh, doing it, uh, getting the sense of adventure, seeing if there is an opportunity. And yet they, they really don't settle down here. And well, Bidwell is exceptional right. in that sense. That's true. But there again, they typify an aspect of the Western movement, which may have a great deal of bearing upon our malaise today. And that is that those people were accustomed to space. Space in those days, Max, space was an earth word. And they moved in space. Oh, he didn't like it here, or it wasn't quite right. You're not all the hell with these Mexicans, you know. I don't like it, but just go someplace else. 
You haven't seen something else over there. There may be something better. Oh, what we call fiddle-footed. Well, many but of us... they were used to work moving in space, honey, night. Doesn't matter whether it's Juan de Oñate coming up and the carving his name in inscription rock by Sopareki, 1598. So very few, so very far from Spain. He is moving in space, and these people are moving in space, too. Maybe that's one of our troubles today. We don't have that sense of movement. We're crammed up against the shore of the Sundown Sea. And you can, I know, some psychologists can make all kinds of things out of that, but at least as far as the Western movement is concerned, they had the space to move in, and they, they took it. I can remember as a kid, Mac, 50 years ago, uh, and have any more brains than any other teenager has at that point. But I can remember the old-time cowboys drifting through that northern Arizona country, northwestern Arizona. They're men in their 50s and 60s. Still drifting, still riding. No families. Just moving. If they didn't like an outfit, to hell with it. Move on. Are they the last of the breed? Well, we still have, we're still pretty mobile. Oh, we're Physical mobile, yeah. People. We're mobile. It's Dick Lillard said, what was it about Los Angeles? A place where the spinsters change addresses as often as call girls. And we're mobile, all right. We're rootless, maybe. I think your division of Bidwell into typical and atypical is, is uh, really a good one because he's... Yeah. Um, he is not like uh, a lot of people who moved to the West. Oh, no, the you know the old jingle, Mac. What was your name in the States? Was it Jackson or Johnson or Bates? Did you kill your wife and flee for your life? Tell me, what was your name in the States? We didn't have any nine... We didn't have any nine-digit, you know, social security numbers, information retrieval systems. Uh, change your name. Start a new life. Again, Bidwell is typical of the best of the Western movement. He moved, he settled, he put down roots. And that's, I think, what it was. The best of them did that. Okay. Well, thank you very much. You are welcome, sir.